In this video, Grand Admiral Sean and I will address the 10 most popular criticisms of The Mandalorian Season 3 opener. Welcome to Galactic Initiative. I'm your host, Jeff. Welcome, Sean. Hello, my friend. Let's begin. I published my review less than 24 hours after the episode's premiere. Link in the description. Before we deal with others' reactions, please share your overall perspectives on the chapter. Well, I found uh, this particular episode to be a little bit redundant and repetitive. Um, I think uh, what they were trying to do with it was address uh, the changes or the new season for the people who missed Book of Boba Fett. And uh, judging by the critical reviews of Book of Boba Fett, a lot of people missed it, so it was necessary. Uh, but I do believe that these attempts to correct the timeline for the new season uh, created some issues with the episode. Uh, it felt kind of a patchwork of exposition as you mentioned in your review so i i enjoyed most of it there was some things that i really loved about it and there was some there was some groaners and some head scratching going on ahead to the 10 most popular criticisms we'll discuss them one at a time as they correspond with the episode number one the armorer couldn't have replenished her covert's numbers so quickly what say you i would agree with that i mean if if the season takes place immediately uh, after season two, which it kind of feels like it does, there, there's no other exposition that says a great period of time has passed. Um, there's a lot of people there now around her. And she, a lot of those people had been killed in the previous season, you know, when they stood up for Mando. And then it was really her and, and the Vizsla fellow that were left at the, uh, end of season two and in the book of Boba Fett. So if, if we're going to go with a straight, you know, this is this episode 17 or whatever it took place if, for a few weeks, maybe a month, whatever, after it doesn't, there's no way sh she would come up with 20 or 30 people, including young or foundlings or younglings or whatever. But, um, that's the least problematic of the, the interactions with, the armor and her tribe uh, because, and we'll, we'll deal with those in, in the other sections, but uh, you could maybe see that they've been maybe put out a call and they're working on it. A few people have shown up, but it did feel like there was a lot of people there for the amount of time that it transpired. Should the writers have given us a sense of time passing how much, how long? And when you think of the Mandalorian diaspora, how would one put out a call? We saw in the book of Boba Fett secret symbols on a space station that you follow the symbols and you, you meet the Vizsla fellow. I like that. <laughs> and the armor. Oh, sorry. The Vizsla fellow. The, yeah. yeah, the Vizsla fellow. <laughs> and the armor. He's heavy set. And the armor. Um, and, uh, and so the doors left open, as you said, probably the least of our worries with this episode uh, but I, I heard this criticism repeated, so I wanted to include it. Yeah, it's just, you could, you know, the, it, with all the amount of exposition that was included at the beginning of this episode, um, you could have even just thrown in, uh, you know, one year later at the beginning of the episode or something like that, right? Um, after you do your quick recap of what's gone before. And then that way, little criticisms like this would not be, they wouldn't come up, right? People would just be like, oh yeah, okay, so it's been a year, right? People have shown up now. It was the stated goal to rebuild, right? And so it would seem less uh, obvious of a thing, like when you first dial in and you're like, wow, that, there's like 20 people there and that that's new, right? When did that happen? You start asking those questions. And so to avoid asking those questions, if you did, if you wanted to go full Clone Wars, you know, since the last time we saw our heroes, you know, and, and give a, a whatever, uh, in uh, the brief rundown, that would have been actually better, I think, and you could have just moved into an episode instead of doing what they did do uh, in this particular episode was spend the first 15 minutes of a very short episode trying to relay the groundwork for those of you who tuned in late. little off topic before we get to the number two criticism. I say to all those who are ignorant and those who feign ignorance, Stop joking about children of the watch eating, uh, drinking, bathing, and sleeping while wearing their helmets. The sect 
forbids helmet removal in the presence of other living beings. It allows helmets to be removed while alone or around droids. Chapter 4 showed Din Djarin privately removing his helmet to eat dinner. And Chapter 8 featured IG-11 uh, removing his helmet for medical attention. Both episodes in Season 1. So, enough. The jokes are foolish. Watch the series before attempting commentary. This is the way. Yeah, that is stupid because it clearly we've demonstrated throughout the previous episodes and through the talk is that as long as it's not removed by someone else, right, which is a great dishonor, it's it's a, a military defeat in the eyes of, of the Mando. Uh, and two, if you take it off yourself, as long as you don't do it in the presence of anyone else, you're fine. Right. And so the people who, yes, who are out there making those those comments are clearly either didn't watch the show or they're trolling uh, because even the whole situation that we saw where the, the child is being given ceremoniously their helmet and taking the oath of, of the Mandalore, yet now you're going to have to be held to those rules. So there could be people even living amongst them, at least temporarily, who aren't even held to the rule of, of not wearing a helmet around others. But once you take the oath, once you join the, the, the children of the watch or whatever, then all those rules kick in. But yeah, if, if people are making those comments, that's just stupid. Like you didn't watch the show. Sorry. All right. Number two, the Mandalorian's tactics against the alligator turtle were laughable. Yeah, I I, I kind of agree with that. I, it's I it, initially I could see them being caught off guard, and they kind of turn and start firing their weapons, and there's a moment of panic because they weren't expecting it. Uh, but once they got into combat, they they all had jetpacks, right? tell the children to run in the cave or ch- you know the people that can't fight to run in the cave and then we'll all go airborne and then we'll we'll figure this thing out um but they didn't do that <laughs> they kept standing there on the beach and getting crushed and getting slapped around by the alligator dragon thing and um it felt contrived in a way like you, you kind of knew at this point okay somebody's going to come save him it's probably going to be ninjaran right like cuz they're they're clearly getting their butts kicked up and down the beach by this thing and if you know the the lore of Mandalore, um, you would know that these people are great warriors and two, they are great tamers of large beasts, right? So they should know how to deal with this. Uh, but for whatever reason, we had to create some drama. We had to create a situation of tension so that Din Djarin could come and save them. Uh, but why is Din Djarin even coming and hanging out with these people? And why? If you watched the book of Boba Fett, you knew that he was banished. You knew that he was no longer allowed to come back until he went and bathed in the waters in the mines of Mandalore. So what's he doing coming back? He has a conversation with the armorer, and it's this whole conversation where she's just reliving that whole thing that happened in the other show. I banish you. And then he leaves, and then he comes back, and he's like, so by banished, do you really mean that like banished, banished, or am I just mostly banished, or is it kind of banished, or what? Do I, and 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 where was I supposed to bathe again? Like it's really stupid. Like if you were a Mandalorian and you believed in these these laws and tenets of your of your religion, uh, th- you banish this guy. He shows up again. You should kill him, right? Unless he comes back bearing proof that he is bathed in the the waters of Mandalore. I was watching that scene, and it's like then I realized, okay, the entire thing with the with them on the beach and the whole crocodile turtle monster dragon Godzilla party that all would have been avoided. He wouldn't even need to put that in the episode because Dinjarin should have been in his ship flying to Mandalore at the beginning of this episode. (laughs) But, um, we needed to tell the folks, you know, just in case they missed it, this is what's going on. And it, and it then now it creates some kind of weird, um, canon issue or continuity issue. Like, oh, they didn't really have that conversation back in Book of Boba Fett. Like, Book of Boba Fett didn't happen, people. I, I don't know. It's weird. Uh, so it, it creates some other weird tension there in the storyline. Like, uh, I couldn't figure out why he's back. As, and if we know anything about Din Djarin, when he's given a quest, he's pretty dogged about it. Like, he should have already been heading to Mandalore, but he wasn't. It, it, it was weird. It, it just creates this whole thing. Like, that whole 
you've created this whole scene now that while it's a cool visual thing, it's the spectacle that we've talked about in past episodes. You know, you got the big monster beast thing and that was really cool, but absolutely no purpose in the show does not move the quest along. Doesn't do anything. It's really just kind of a, it's a recap. They should, they should have had five minutes at the beginning before they ran the, the, the Mando theme song that really covered all the stuff that they were trying to cover in the rest of the episode. Indeed. So that, that brings us to number three, a longer summation here. Din Jaren should have gone directly to Mandalore, not wasted time with side quests. Season three's opener didn't move the narrative. It just reviewed the book of Boba Fett. And the book of Boba Fett wasn't good, but were things so bad that they necessitated this type of uh, beginning? Yeah, we could we could speculate one of two ways, right? We could say that um, that the people at Disney Lucasfilm have realized that the book of Boba Fett was garbage, and they just don't want any more eyeballs on it because they don't want to make people mad, and so they're kind of almost rewriting it in a way. Um, some like the scene with the armor is a scene that was a duplicate of a scene that was in the show. And so um, it feels a little bit like a rewrite or like a, Hey, let's just, let's just pretend like that thing never happened. Right. Or there could just be that this there, this is a result of the power struggle uh, that, that is reported to be happening within the Lucasfilm leadership. And that perhaps John Favreau is saying, you really don't want to go see that crap. Right. So let's just keep eyes on us people because we're the real Star Wars folks here on the Mando show. Um, that could be it as well. But for all of the accusations that Disney and Lucasfilm are a, a soulless corporate entity that is all about profits, they really don't do marketing and selling very well. Um, when I was a kid, I used to have a subscription to the G.I. Joe comic book. Long format story told over 155 issues. And whenever they reference something that happened in a previous issue of the comic, there would be a little asterisk next to the character's dialogue. And then there'd be a little box in the bottom of that panel that said, see, ep- or see issue 10 or issue 20 or whatever. And then a, and the editor note. And then the, the reader's you know, interest is piqued. Right? Well, what are you talking about? Well, the, then the editor says, well, if you really want to know, go back to issue whatever. And if you don't have issue, whatever, guess what you're going to do? You're going to go buy it. Or you're going to find somebody that has it. And you're going to read it. Right? And so you are creating a demand for your product. And what we should be doing, if Disney is a soulless pursuer of profits, what they should be doing is you know, making those offhand references. right? And then let the internet take care of it. And then you're going to figure it out. And then you can guess what you're going to do. You're going to go back and you're going to stream that episode. Ah, that's what they want, right? They want people streaming and clicking and doing stuff. That's what they should be doing. But instead, somebody somewhere is trying to overwrite or keep eyeballs off that show. And whether it's intentional or unintentional, um, but they're creating conditions in this first episode now where you don't have to go back and watch Book of Boba Fett if you don't want to. And that's great for me, the viewer, but it's bad for them, the business. Number four, two-parter. IG-11 wouldn't have been salvageable. Its statue wouldn't have contained actual pieces. Facts. That is absolute facts. So we all saw at the end of the episode when he self-detonates, he has the thermal detonator in his chest cavity, which blows up, kills all the stormtroopers at the mouth of the tunnel. That was in the center of his chest cavity. And, And I'm always harping on there's too much science in science fiction, which makes the fiction terrible but the science of that doesn't jibe with what we just saw now i get it they have a statue of ig11 in the town square that's great he was uh, deeply involved in the freeing of that planet from imperial control and the the newfound prosperity but then it becomes this macguffin thing for the Mandalorian. He's like, Oh, I got to find this memory card and all this stuff. And I got to do all this stuff, but there wouldn't be any pieces of him left. And so you couldn't rebuild him. Uh, and then even if you go get a new memory card, uh, the old memory card is destroyed or damaged. 
Um, so he refit, reset to factory standards. It, all that training that Quill did to make him a nanny droid killer, um, it's gone. And so this this focus that Din Djarin has about, oh, well, you know, he's going to, he's the only droid I trust. Well, okay, they're great. That's a nice sentiment. I appreciate that. Um, but it's really dumb. It's it's really dumb. Uh, it, it creates a it creates a stupid contrivance, and it creates a, another silly side quest. Next thing you know, they're going to bring Queel back. Just move on, you know. Move on. Yeah, bring in new characters. Create new characters. This now this gives you opportunities for cameos from other fun people who want to be involved in a, in a Star Wars project, maybe other big name actors, whatever. But again, it's just more weird side quests and and things that are really have nothing to do with anything. So go get another droid and get to Mandalore. Mando, that's what you're supposed to be doing. Well, there's an easy answer here, and clearly it's been overlooked by most people on the worldwide net web. What if I told you that IG-11 was constructed by the same people who built the second Death Star? Yeah, no, I get it. It's well, then you know you have the other question. I mean, there's all kinds of technological canonical issues. Um, yeah. In the first episode of the first season of Mandalorian, yeah. IG-11 is killed by one shot from Mando's pistol to the head at point blank range, and yes. after 25 shots at point blank range on the floor in Grief Karga's office, they had to kill it with a statue. The purpose of IG-11 self destruct mode is to leave nothing, leave no tech. That could be uh, copied or used against <laughs> against the uh, the creators. Uh, leave, leave nothing. Destroy all of it. What? Well, and it also to go back to your your point about the rise of Skywalker. Well, that means that you probably could have raised the the Death Star out of the ocean and flown it and blown up another planet at that point. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I know. I know a Mon Cala in a blue sweater that can fix anything. <laughs> all right. Uh, number five. Grogu lacked character development. He continued to be a cute plot device. That is accurate. Um, so he has spent time with Master Luke. He has been uh, schooled in the ways of the Force. I'm sure that Luke probably had a couple of conversations with him about how we use the Force for defense and never attack, and all that has a strong on um, strong effect on the weak minded and all those Yoda isms and Ben Kenobi isms that he learned uh, when he was studying the Force. Yet Grogu is uh, using the Force unsupervised to get snacks, and he just continues to be the cute, waddly kid in the burlap bag. And as I mentioned in the previous conversation that we've had, um, too much of this is going to make people not like the character. And I'm already, I'm already finding that um, the newness and the cuteness of Baby Yoda has worn off on me, and I'm over it. Um, he's not. He's a static character. He's not growing. There's no changes. I'm not interested in his story anymore because I know that he is just set dressing. He's he's a cute thing that shows up from time to time, so the ladies will keep watching. And, and you know, I hate to say that, but that's pretty much what he's turned into. Well, I'll argue uh, one aspect. Grogu was not a plot device in this chapter. Lack of character development, yes. But the show didn't use Grogu for its plot. Grogu was along for the ride. No, he he wasn't the plot contrivance, but he's he's it's wholly unnecessary. So so let, let's let's stand back. Let's take the you know the fifty thousand foot view of what's going on in the Mandalorian right now. Season three is Mando has been banished from his covert. He has been banished from the the, the children of the Watch. Uh, he is an apostate. He is a man outside of the religion now, and he is a zealot, right? He is a religious zealot. Let's just like, call it what it is. And if you are a religious zealot and you have suddenly found yourself in apostasy and you are trying to get back in the good graces of the religion that you're zealous about, um, you don't care about anything else. So we should have started the episode with him in the ship heading to Mandalore and getting to Mandalore and maybe spending the first three or four episodes of this season with him trying to navigate all of the problems with being on Mandalore. And then maybe he goes, picks up baby Yoda from the frog lady and they go on and do their cute stuff that he's, he's totally superfluous. Like shouldn't even be there. 
You should still be with Master Luke, but the Book of Boba Fett screwed all that up, and we can talk about that another time. But it's totally just not worth it. And the whole thing is, if you had left him with Luke for the entire third season, or most of the third season, then when you bring him back, it would be a huge impact, and everyone will be excited, and it'll be so much, oh my god, we miss Grogu. And I probably would have said that. But now I'm like, I'm over Grogu. I'm sorry. Number six. The Anzellans reminded viewers all narratives, including The Mandalorian, lead to the failed sequel trilogy. These creatures are another physical manifestation of Kathleen Kennedy's crusade to redeem the irredeemable and save her legacy. Accurate. That is true. However, asterisk, uh, Baba Frick was the only thing, in my opinion, uh, that came out of the sequel trilogy that's worthy of hanging on to. But... It is a valid criticism to say that the more of these things that keep showing up in the Mando, um, the more this is pointing towards the trilogy. And it's, this is that death struggle uh, between her and Favreau. Uh, she keeps wanting to interject and wants to keep tying it into this stuff because it will make it harder and harder for when she's gone and he's the boss to do something about the sequel trilogy. And so... She's basically she's laying the poison pill or, or putting down the booby traps because it's like, oh, well, if you decanonize or if you reject the sequel trilogy, look what you're going to have to do to your Mando show. Because oh, we got, you know, Babu Frick in there and that's Babu freaking awesome. It's, it's that kind of stuff. But again, I'm partially biased in this. I mean, if you brought back Jar Jar, Darth Maul and Babu Frick, I'd be happy. Right. So. But I also understand what problems that would create in the canon. It's it just, uh, I like those characters. I think they're neat. Um, I really enjoyed it. But now you also double down on the on the cute thing, right? You got Baby Yoda giving these little guys hugs and stuff. And it's like, okay, this, now I'm just, I feel like I'm watching Animal Planet show too cute where you've just got a bunch of kittens rolling around in with each other. Like, it's it just move on. Like, we don't need to do that. I can see the criticism that these things will ultimately lay the groundwork for not being able to disavow the sequel trilogy. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't mind the end zealots. Um, I wasn't as fond of Babu Frick in the rise of Skywalker as you, but the end in this chapter, uh, they fit here. And the humor fit, uh, Mando having to scrunch down and, and sit in their workshop reminded me of Mando in the, uh, in the, in the sand crawler way back when. And, uh, and Grief Karga leaning in to translate <laughs> when, it, when it wasn't necessary. Uh, funny. I enjoyed it. But it, but it is, it, yeah, it's, it, this is a sign this is the sign of the sequels. This is, this, we're moving toward the sequels. I, I hope there's a fork in the road, a uh, split in the track, but hey, just, just ahead is The Force Awakens. And beyond it are the two worst Star Wars films ever made. If you want to, if, if you want to assume best intentions and, and honesty and, and, and goodwill on the part of the people uh, who are making the show, they'll say, they would say, okay, we're going to have this, we're going to have this plot, right? And it's going to be this plot for the Mando's got to find parts to rebuild IG-11. Everybody's like, oh, okay, cool. That'd be cool. You know, again, it's, you know, him and his robot problem and all that stuff. No, okay, sweet. Yeah, let's talk about it. So what are we going to do? And like, well, we got to get somebody who can fix the robot. And if somebody like, oh, well, yeah, that little cool dude, is a robot guy. He's the robot whisperer, right? He did the whole thing with three people and people are like, yeah, they're a race of robot fixers. And we didn't really have anything about Babu Frick other than he was this awesome droid fixer guy. Um, so now you like they do in star Wars, right? They're like, Hey, that was a really cool race of, of alien or whatever. Like let's bring him back in this episode and give him a little more backstory. Right. Like we did with the Ugnots. Right? The Ugnots were, Again, something interesting to have in Empire Strikes Back, but now with Queel and the stuff, he talked about how his people were actually enslaved by the Empire and that their skills were used to further the war effort and all this stuff, and they feel terrible about that, and they earned their freedom, and they don't want war anymore. And like you know, that was awesome, and that was a huge buildup on something that happened completely 40 years ago. Uh, 
So I could see if, if you want to give people the benefit of the doubt, like saying, well, let's talk about, are they, is it, was it just Babu Frick or do we want to make them a, like a race of, of robot guys or whatever, or droid fixers or whatever. And, and if we do, that'd be really cool. We can use them in the show and fans seem to really like that character. Like, okay, great, let's do it. But the underlying thing there is still, you know, the, the gray lining to that silver cloud, right, is that it's from the sequel trilogy, and now we are incorporating it into our storytelling. To be continued. But let's move on now to number seven. In lieu of a story, the series relies on video game fetch quests. Oh, absolutely. At least, at least this episode, it sets up. Like it, it does. It sets up like a video game, right? Okay. Well, first we had to go to Mandalore and get the the stuff, right? But we can't get to the stuff unless we get the droid, and we can't get the droid unless we get more stuff to fix the droid. Oh, and by the way, I'm just going to stop in on my future ex-wife, Bo-Katan Kreese, and say, "Hey, girl, what's up?" And now I'm going to get another side quest that says, "Please help me find the night owls and the other Mandalores so I can do the Mandalore thing." And he's like, "Yeah, hey, girl, I got you." Right? Like now, so now we've set up the season. But that's a lot of side quests, and there's only, what, eight episodes? So it's going to be a short season, and they're doing that thing again that I know you and I and others have sort of kicked to death. But if you're only going to have eight episodes in a season, why are you giving us 36-minute episodes? And that includes credits and recaps, okay? We need more content, especially if you're going to have an entire episode about getting the thing for IG-11 and an entire episode or two or three about... Um, helping Bo-Katan and then you're going to have to still have your find the waters of life Paul Atreides and then then you get to come back and then you got to address your exile with the coven right well if each one of those is two episodes your season's over and what have we really done right not not a whole lot maybe restored Bo-Katan as the leader of of the Mandalorians but other than that (laughs) you know like and, and he's now no longer an apostate it feels like there's a lot of extra junk in there and it does feel like a video game. Get your gear and you got to level up and you got to do the thing and you get, and, and it's, th- that was kind of like season two felt a little bit that, that there was some of that going on and they haven't stepped away from that, which is too bad. Well, not a defense, but before there were video games, there were adventure serials and the flavor of this chapter for me was a 1950s swashbuckling adventure serial. This format, the short episodes, I don't like them either, but they do keep you wanting more and they do have the feel of those serials. There were writing issues for me, plot issues that we've discussed, um, all these things. And yet, in the end, it felt like a really fun, lighthearted adventure in the style of old Star Wars and certainly in the style of one of the foundational pieces that Lucas built Star Wars on, the 1950s adventure serials. I can, I can see that. Um, but even, even with the adventure serials, though, the adventure serials were one long story broken up into small pieces with a cliffhanger at the end of each of them. They'd fly the, the spaceship in the side of the mountain. They're like, oh, no, what does this mean for our heroes? And then you tune in next week, and they didn't actually fly into the mountain. They saved the ship at the last minute. And then they keep telling the story, right? Because you you were mandated by the, the studio and the, and the movie houses. Like, oh, it can only be so many minutes, right? Because we're going to play this before the feature film. And so you take a, a movie or a movie-length story, and you chop it up into 10-minute episodes, and now you've got that whole thing that that's fine um the original star wars was similar right it, but it was actual full feature length movie that the first one didn't necessarily end on a cliffhanger but the second one did right but you are again telling a story you're moving it along um it is all very connected and there's a lack of that MacGuffin-y feeling in the original Star Wars trilogy. There's something missing in this show. Uh, And maybe that the overarching story piece is not being told well enough or it's not as obvious enough to the viewer. 
But I think that's like the real criticism that makes it feel like, yeah, it's it's just a unrelated series of side quests or whatever, or these little things, because it's it's not in the moment it doesn't feel like it's serving anything. I mean, maybe sometimes you know you get to episode five and you're like, oh, that's why they did that. Okay, great. All right, okay, that makes sense now, you know. But there there's a danger there that they don't get those aha moments from the audience, and you're like, okay, I just watched eight episodes of what exactly? don't waste any more installments because what we've done now is we've created the, the season in review episode and that's taken now one eighth of our total episodes um, and taken it off the table. All right. So now I've got to pack the rest of my season into seven episodes. Now, if you make those seven episodes longer, make them an hour long each, no problem. All right. We can get it done. But if you're going to continue, and if this is a problem that's been on, Mandalorian all three seasons now and Book of Boba Fett whatever that when you need the long episode you get a short episode and when you need the short episode you get a long episode and that's problematic can't argue that all right let's move on to number eight the pirates looked and sounded ridiculous Star Wars of the Caribbean or Caribbean if you prefer both are acceptable yeah I I feel that there was some cross pollination there amongst Disney franchises. Um, I mean, even the look of the pirate guy with the seaweedy face and all that stuff. It's like, do you have any other concept artists at Disney Lucasfilm that could come up with something that doesn't look like your other pirate movie? The conversations that they had with the guys on the planet when there was the gunfight kind of scenario, and which I thought was good. Didn't mind that scene much. You know, the guys show up and they're like, what do you mean it's a school? Yeah, it's bro, the bar is a school now. We do different things differently now here on our on Navarro. So, okay, great. But the captain guy was like Davy Jones, whatever. I forget what character it was in Pirates of the Caribbean. I saw that one once. But the guy who has the squid face, the Kraken face, whatever. It's like, man, it was a cross between Swamp Thing and a Kraken. And it just, that really took me out of the episode. I mean, that was my big, my big issue and I, you've heard me complaining a lot on this episode about this and i apologize people i really did actually enjoy the show but my biggest criticism or the biggest thing that took me out of the show and gave me the oh come on man moment was when they revealed the pirate i was just like oh god really like you couldn't you couldn't find another costume in the closet down there at neil scanlon's uh monster shop that doesn't look like a dude from a johnny depp movie because yeah it's just it's too much these guys are now going to be, I guess, the bad guys. Maybe Moff Gideon will escape prison during this season. Maybe not. Maybe that's season four. We don't have a bad guy. So we had to have this moment now, again, in this in this episode, setting up who the heavy is going to be for the season. And so I guess what? Well, every time Din Djarin lands somewhere or thinks he's safe or whatever, the pirates are going to show up. Or the pirates are going to show up at the most inopportune moment. You know, Din Djarin's about to jump into the the sweet, sweet baths below the, the city of whatever in Mandalore. And he's going to purge his uh, his impurities in the eyes of the Mandalore. And, also, and then the pirates are going to show up and like, beat him up and take his helmet or something. I, I don't know. It, it just I feel like the, the aesthetic of the pirate captain for sure was a little too on the nose. And it was very uh, Vespa's in Book of Boba Fett for me. You can take the concepts, right? People who live outside the law um, have a weirdly democratic business model, um, you know, things like that, but are also violent and um, are uh, constantly under hunt from, the, you know, legitimate governments. Um, that's a great concept. That would make a great show. They call black sales. But anyway, but the 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 on the nose portrayal, like you might as well have had a, a eye patch and a, and a hook. Let's just go full Disney, right? So if you think about like the guys who were on the skiff and on Jabba's sail bars were a little bit piratey, right? There was some, there was some bandanas and some billowy shirts, but it wasn't so on the nose. And I think Hondo's jacket is similar, but I guess in the, I guess for a cartoon, you don't really, it's a cartoon, I guess. I don't know. And I'm sorry to diminish anybody who might think that, Clone Wars is high art. I know it is. I enjoyed it. But I think you can get away with certain things in a cartoon that you can't get away with in live action television. Um, 
and that's maybe maybe that's a, a you know an incorrect opinion and maybe someone in hollywood could call me and, and let me know but i feel like when you're doing live action stuff it can look very much like you just went down the hall and said hey what do you guys got left over from davy jones's locker like we need a couple of jackets and whatever right and I'm pretty sure that at some point someone's going to do a deep dive frame by frame analysis and they're going to find out that those jackets actually appeared on extras in one of the Johnny Depp movies. But I think that's where the criticism comes from, um, that people are more likely to just say, oh, it's a cartoon or whatever. It's for kids like, haha, that's fun, even though we all know it wasn't necessarily a cartoon for kids. This kind of feels a little bit like, hey, how do we cut corners or save costs or whatever? And they're like, oh, well, we'll just drive across the lot and. You know, see what they got over on the Pirates of the Penzance set we can borrow. Nice, nice use of Davy Jones' locker, by the way. All right, number nine, two parts. Cara Dune's absence was poorly handled. Gina Carano's termination should never be forgiven. Uh, yes and yes. Um, if you go back and listen to some of our previous episodes here on Galactic Initiative, you'll know my feelings about the termination of Gina Carano and actions that I took in order to not enrich the Disney corporation as a result. However, um, she was a character in the show and it has to be addressed, right? Because if you said nothing, that's even more weird. Like, Hey, we're just watching this show. And, and for people who don't follow the trade mags and they don't follow the politics, so they don't follow any of that stuff. they just be like, Hey, wasn't there a, a lady in the last two seasons? Like she had a weird tattoo. Like what? You know, and people are like, I don't know. And so they had to talk about it, uh, but the way they did it, it felt cheap. Like, well, she was doing a great job and, and she was doing such a great job. They came and recruited her. Now she's gone. So that implies she might come back. Or are we going to get like a, a, a government telegram as someone from the Republican to show up at grief's office and knock on the door? I'm like, well, I'm terribly sorry, but Carrie Dune died in combat. You know, like, like is that what we're going to get? If they are truly committed to never rehiring Gina Carano, which is the current administration of, of Lucasfilm's opinion, right? She is never coming back. Right? There are those in Lucasfilm who want her back, and there are those in the fan base that want her back. Um, and so there are rumors, right? And we are not a show that deals in speculation or rumors for the most part and we give our opinions and things like that but you know there is there is talk about whether or not she actually will come back so they couldn't the compromise i think that happened is they mentioned that she's not going to be in the season right she's not going to be here right she's off doing special forces secret stuff for the republic and everybody's like ooh, fancy right but now you're not going to see her for the next eight episodes. And and I think the hope by people like Favreau and Filoni is that by the time we actually get around to fully having to address her situation, there is a regime change at Disney that will allow her to come back. Um, I've heard speculation about the Rangers of the Republic show and how that may still deal with Cara Dune in some way, uh, but they can't really move forward with it because... Kathy Kennedy is blocking that right? or she wants it to be something else sans Cara Dune. Uh, so who knows, but it feels, it feels like they didn't do whatever they were supposed to be doing any justice. It was kind of a throwaway line. You know, Mando looks around like, Hey, where's, where's, where's the cutie? And then grief is like, ah, she's on a job. And then that's it. It feels almost like it cheapens her character and her character's contribution to the show and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but I don't know if anybody could have got any more dialogue in there about her because of the attitude that leadership has towards Gina Carano. So you couldn't have like you couldn't say, oh, she died off screen and like show her funeral. Right. And have everybody eulogizing her and talking about how awesome she was, because that just goes into a narrative that Disney Lucasfilm doesn't want to have. So. I guess I'm still upset about what they did to her and why and the, the hypocrisy and double standard behind that. Um, because if they really followed the policy that they said they were following, there would be no Mando show because Pedro Pascal would have also had to have been terminated. I'll just leave it at that. I, it, I'm still mad about Gina Carano and no, they didn't handle her separation from the series, her character's separation from the series very well. Yeah. 
one line isn't enough. We'll need more. But um, that one line might be a victory for Jon Favreau to keep her character alive in Galaxy. So we'll see. All right, our last criticism, number 10. The Night Owl's desertion made no sense. They would have continued their mission to retake Mandalore. I know that Bo-Katan is near and dear to your heart, so your your thoughts on the Night Owls. I don't get what's going on with her character right now. I don't get what's going on with the story. She had a contingent of warriors that followed her. They were all the Night Owl clan or whatever it was called. Um, their goal was to reunify Mandalore. And bring back all the Mandalorians, come back to the planet, reestablish the society. Depending on you know, how many episodes of Clone Wars and Rebels you've watched, Bo Katan was not the she was not the Mandalore, capital T, capital M, right? Uh, because she does not have the dark saber anymore. But she had followers when she was not the capital T, capital M, the Mandalore, right? They followed her because she is of a noble family. Uh, in the, the Mandalorian culture. Um, she's the leader of her clan, whatever. Those people should not have abandoned her. Like you said in your review of the show, you know, it's like she has a castle now. Like that's something that happened very quickly. These are the things that give us pause and make us ask the questions of did time really pass between these episodes? Because, you know, last time we saw her, she was off punching stormtroopers. And what, what happened <laughs> in, in between episodes what what's going on here with her character her character is a very strong person and a strong leader and not one to have bouts of melancholy um especially you know if you think about what actually happens in the mandalorian people and the great purge the night of a thousand tears and all that stuff um and the fact that she doesn't have the lightsaber and the guy with the lightsaber walks into her house and says hey yo what's up girl and she's like i'm sad if you are going to be the Mandalore, you must defeat the holder of the dark saber in combat. So then you can become the Mandalore. Perhaps what will happen. And this is again, me speculating. I've seen no future episodes. I have not employed by Lucasfilm in any way, shape or form, but I have a sneaking suspicion that the only way something's going to be on Mandalore or something's going to be going on with Mandalore when they try and go there. And the only way Din Djarin is going to be able to go bathe in the sweet, sweet waters of the spas underneath the city of whatever on Mandalore is if he retakes Mandalore. So he may ultimately wind up having to quip out the Darksaber and be like, yo, Mandalorians, I'm the Mandalore, and let's go take Mandaloria back. And they're like, yeah, and they all go. And then he's like, all right, cool. Um, somebody want this thing? Because I got to go take a bath. Right. And that's maybe how it happens. I don't know. But... It does seem that her character is acting much differently than she has in previous iterations, whether it be Rebels or Clone Wars or previous seasons of The Mandalorian. And um, I, I just wish they would treat my future ex-wife better. <laughs> Fair enough. I, I, I understand Bo-Katan not attacking Din Djarin. There's precedent for it. More to come with Bo-Katan for sure. Obviously, she's a main character in the series. She's here to stay. We'll see more of her. She won't sulk through the whole season. So we've tackled the top 10 criticisms. Good discussion. Thank you, Sean. I've spoken. More Mando conversations to come during season three. Check out Galactic Initiative for all things Star Wars. Galactic Initiative is not authorized or endorsed by Lucasfilm Limited. The name Star Wars and all related materials are registered trademarks of Lucasfilm Limited, a subsidiary of the Walt Disney Company, but rights reserved. Galactic Initiative is a registered trademark and other products and company names are trademarks of their respective holders. Use does not imply affiliation or endorsement. 